This is part three of three of the Poinsettia Diagnostic Webinar offered by eGrow.org. Raymond Cloyd will cover insects and mites in part three of the webinar. In part one, Kelly Ivers from North Carolina State University will cover common poinsettia diseases, and in part two, Brian Whipker from North Carolina State University will cover common nutrient disorders of poinsettias. Okay, um, well good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to be talking about, let's see if I go back. What I want to talk about. Okay. What I want to talk about is identification and management of insect and mite pests of poinsettias. And uh, insect and mite pests diagnosis is a little more simplistic than or easier than diseases and nutrition because you can generally see these organisms, uh, except for a couple of them, that you may need some high uh, magnification, and we will we'll talk about each one of those as we go. Okay, so the uh, introduction, uh, identification, and then we're gonna, after each insect or mite pest, we'll talk about the management strategies, and then finally, we will cover some questions. So we're gonna be talking about insects and mite pests that uh, attack uh, the bracts, the leaves, the stem, and also the roots. Okay, oops. Okay, so the major insect and mite pests of greenhouse grown poinsettias, the roots are obviously going to be fungus gnat. Uh, leaves and stem include white fly, thrips, in particular the western flower thrips, broad mite, Lewis mite, mealybug, and on bracts would also include uh, western flower thrips. Fungus gnats, <clears throat> the first one. Fungus gnat uh, larvae, as you know, have a black head capsule, which separates, separates them out from shore fly. And the adult stage of fungus gnats have a Y shape in their wing, in their forewing. Now, the larval stage on the left is the one that causes all the damage because it chews the roots and also can vector diseases, whereas the adult is primarily a nuisance. And common symptoms of poinsettias that are being attacked by fungus gnats are stunting and wilting, and even if you water them, that doesn't help, but that actually makes it worse because uh, moist conditions stimulate fungus gnat population. So uh, that's, so the larva is a damaging stage, and the adult primarily is a nuisance. Give you an overall life cycle of the uh, fungus gnat, well, the eggs, laying clusters, uh, hatching the larva, then they go through a pupa stage, and they come out as an adult. And in general, under the conditions where poinsettias are grown uh, from August to November, it takes about 20 to 24 days for the life cycle to be completed. So where did these buggers come from? Well, they can come from bad growing medium, uh, unsealed garbage containers, growing medium with plants, old growing medium, and also moisture gravel areas underneath benches especially those where weeds are growing because weeds uh, keep the area around them moist, wet, and again, those are a, that's a great conducive environment for development of fungus gnats and, of course, the last one, shore flies. And also any compost areas outside the greenhouses. So all of these are potential sources of fungus gnat uh, contamination and thus infestation. So this is what the fungus and adults on yellow sticky cards should look like. If yours look much worse than this, uh, you have another issue. But again, you want to keep the numbers down. And we don't have any thresholds, unfortunately. Uh, but you want to look at probably between 10 to 20 adults per sticky card per week on one side as sort of a threshold. When it gets above that, it's probably time to do something in terms of regulation or control of the fungus that's in the poinsettia crop. Again, the fungus gnat larvae are feeding on the root hairs. And what this image demonstrates and want to highlight is this upper layer of the growing medium is fairly dry. And one way to avoid problems with fungus gnats is to allow the top one to two inches to dry down. If the adult females lay eggs, the egg survival will be very low, or you're going to have high mortality and you're going to have fewer fungus and larvae feeding on the roots. So uh, a, a good way, strategy to minimize 
fungus nets when you get out of propagation is to allow that top one to two inches to dry down, which creates a very inhospitable environment for, for egg, uh, eggs to actually hatch, so you get very high egg mortality. So this is to give you an example of what fungus ant larvae can do to cutting. Again, fungus ant larvae are really prevalent under moist conditions. And as you see in the circle, fungus ants can chew on the roots uh, or chew on the callus areas and actually also enter a, a cutting. As this image shows, this was a poinsettia cutting where the fungus gnats bored into it, and there's about 10 to 15. This only shows about uh, half of them that were in this cutting. As you can tell, this cutting was pretty much history and had to be disposed of. So some management for fungus gnat. Many of the cultural sanitation practices for the other organisms I'll talk about are going to be the same. But the first one is keeping your growing medium a little on the drier side, not too wet. Of course, under propagation, that can be difficult. Remove weeds. I mentioned that weeds uh, create an environment that's ex extra moist, which allows for fungus nets to develop in any old growing medium from the area. If you can use pasteurized or bag growing medium, that's always going to help you in alleviating problems with fungus gnats. For scouting, use yellow sticky cards for the adults. And it's important to place the sticky cards near the growing medium, not above the crop canopy, because fungus net adults don't fly very well. They hang around the growing medium where it's nice and moist, and that's where you're going to catch most of your fungus net adults. The larva, you can use a potato disc, about a quarter of an inch, insert it into the growing medium, allow it to sit for 48 hours, take it off, and if you see fungus nets with their black head capsules underneath where they're feeding on the potato discs, uh, you have larva. Um, management, we talk about pesticides, we have insect growth regulators, contact insecticides, some of the neonicotinoids, and microbials such as BTI. We have some excellent biologic controls, including the nematode, road beetle, and predatory mite. If you're wanting to try biologic control, uh, the primary insect you can start with is fungus gnats. So when I get to the insecticide images, I'm just going to mention two things. One is thorough coverage of all plant parts or the growing medium. And the second one is rotate products with different modes of action. Uh, natural is a stomach poison. Uh, Pylon and Duragard are contacts. Citation is an insect growth regulator. Safari is a contact. And Distance is an insect growth regulator. So I'm not going to go through a lot, but I want to highlight one important thing, and that is be sure you read the label because especially when we're talking about poinsettias and BRAC for contact materials, you want to avoid phytotoxicity. Okay? Oops, what happened? Brian, what happened? Okay, we lost, uh, hello, we out there still? Uh, so let's talk about ne the nematode. This is the nematode product called Nemesis. Uh, the species is standard name of LTI. Okay, and this is an image of what happens when the, the larva of a fungus net, when they get infected, the uh, nematodes consume the internal contents, and then they go through several generations and then uh, burst out. So those of you having spaghetti this evening might want to remember this issue, remember this image. So what about white fly? Uh, you know white fly, the nymphs on the left, the adult on the right. Uh, they feed on the phloem contents. Uh, they're primarily on the leaf undersides, and they cause leaf distortion, plant stunting, and wilting. The major green uh, white fly types that you'll run into are the sweet potato white fly. That is a major pest of poinsettia. The banded wing white fly is one that you'll encounter in the fall. Uh, it comes in, but reports uh, indicate that it does not develop very well on poinsettia. It may lay eggs, but it does not develop very well. You may get some greenhouse white fly, but the majority of white fly species you'll deal with are the sweet potato white fly. Just to give you an idea of the life cycle of white fly, the adult females lay the eggs on leaf undersides. The eggs hatch into nymphs, and then they undergo a pupa stage or transitional stage and come out as adults. And in general, under conditions in which poinsettias are grown, it takes about 21 to 26 days to go from egg to adult. 
Again, I'll emphasize that when you look at white flies, their majority of the life stages are located on the leaf underside. You can see some adults here, some nymphs, and some smaller eggs. This is an example of a situation that you should never see, but these are the nymphal stages of white flies on the underside of a poinsettia leaf. And these are primarily sweet potato white fly uh, nymphs and also pupal, st pupal stages. Now, to tell the difference between that and greenhouse white fly, the pupa of a, of a sweet potato white fly are like a berm on the leaf, where a uh, greenhouse white fly, they're kind of perpendicular and have sides and look like a cake with these hairs of, or hairs or steady around the periphery of the pupa. Some of the management strategies, again, uh, weed removal. Many weeds out there are an alternate food source or a reservoir for greenhouse for the white flies. Uh, avoid over fertilizing plants. Studies have shown that poinsettias receiving excessive amounts of fertilizer are much more attractive to white flies. And also remove any leaf debris. Uh, if there's any pupa on the leaf debris, the adults will still emerge and they can go back onto the main poinsettia crop. For scouting, yellow sticky cards you're going to need for the adults. You'll also have to perform visual inspection to monitor for the eggs, pupa, and the nymphs. Uh, again, weed management. Here's an example of a greenhouse where they had weeds close to an opening, so the white flies really had a free access through the cellulose pads and into the poinsettia crop. So you want to keep weeds around 20 to 30 feet around from any openings that includes uh, doors, sidewalls, or any vents. And again, you cannot find nymphs, eggs, and pupa on the sticky cards. You do have to do visual inspections, as is demonstrated in this image. And then it, you wait, really, again, you can uh, randomly select certain plants, flag them, and then come back to those every time to see if eggs have hatched and if pupa have had adults emerge from them. So what about some management white flies? We have contact insecticides, translaminar insecticides, systemics, and insect growth regulators. We also have some good biological control agents, including parasitoids, predators, and beneficial fungi that are commercially available. The very Balsiani is Botanigard, and Isteria phomocerosis is sold as either no fly or preferral. So I want to talk about, again, the insecticides are listed here, but again, the points I want to make is, one, read the label. Two, use products with different modes of action and rotation programs to uh, alleviate the prospects of resistance in whitefly populations. But I want to talk about two terms. The one is translaminar, and the other one is systemic. So what translaminar means in some of these products, and the label will state this, that when the material is sprayed on the leaf, it penetrates the leaf cuticle and then resides inside the leaf for approximately seven to 14 days, depending on the product. And any white flies that have hatched from eggs and uh, feed as nymphs will ingest the lethal concentration and thus be killed, even after the residue is dry. And then systemics are those that you're familiar with, such as Marathon and Safari. You apply them to the growing medium and they move throughout the plant parts and get into areas where the white flies are feeding. And as you know, the movement depends on water solubility, and Safari is about 80 times more water soluble than in the Clopid or Marathon, which means it moves to the plant faster than Marathon does. You can, again, pop purchase some biologic control agents. If you don't know which white fly species you have, you can actually purchase combinations, as shown here. Incarcia formosa is a parasitoid for greenhouse white fly. Eritmosus rimicus is a parasitoid for uh, the sweet potato white fly bee biotype. If you're going to use biocontrol, you have to do it early on before white fly populations are building up or excessive. The next pest, uh, one of my favorites, is well, they're all my favorites, but this is one of them, and that is western flower tips. The adult is on the left, the nymph is on the right. They cause direct feeding injury to leaves and also bracts. So the life cycle of western flower thrips, this is an image from Jim Baker at North Carolina State University. The ones that are circled are the ones susceptible to contact insecticides. The pupa and the egg are pretty resilient. And under conditions in which poinsettias are grown, it takes about 18 to 24 days, depending on temperature, to go from egg to adult. Also, 
the adult and the nymphs are susceptible to the biologic control agents, which, which we will discuss in a few minutes. So here's what western flower tips adults look from a bird's eye view. They're about uh, two to three millimeters in length, and this is a grouping of about five adults. They can be found on the top of the leaves and also on the undersides of poinsettia leaves. Here's what they'll look like on yellow sticky cards if you scout. The, the beady eyes, but most importantly, is the fringes or hairs on the wings, and that's what separates them out from any other uh, insect pests that you may be dealing with on poinsettias. Some of the damage uh, thrips do have what we call su pierce and sucking mouth parts, no longer rasping. Uh, and so here's the poinsettia, which is exhibiting damage from poinsettia feeding. And if you, if, if the close up will show that you have sort of an octopus spider like appearance. What happens is the thrips feed in the center area, cause the damage, and then the rest of the leaf grows around that, giving it kind of, again, spider-like or octopus-looking appearance. The management, cultural is about the same as we've talked about. Remove heavily infested or damaged plants, or give me your competitor if you wish. Screen greenhouse openings if you can. Remove all weeds. Again, as we talked about, weeds are great sources of thrips and also some of the viruses they will vector, although the viruses are not much of a problem on poinsettia. And if you want to use massive yellow sticky tape, that can be effective in mass trapping western flower thrips. In the scouting process, you can use either yellow or blue colored sticky cards to monitor. I do prefer the yellow because you can see them easier and you'll also pick up adult white flies in the process. Pesticides, we have the contact, translaminar, and a good mixture that I recommend is Botanigarda Bavaria bassiana with one of the azadiractin compounds. That mixture seems to be very synergistic and has proven to be very effective in dealing with uh, western flowers that's not just on Point City but other crops. Biological, we have uh, predatory mites, predatory bugs. These predatory mites here uh, are ones that feed on the thrips pupa, so they're applied to the growing medium and they're supposedly supposed to attack the thrips pupa. And again, beneficial fungi, such as Bavaria bassiana, sold as Botanigard, or Acerea mosseroseus, which is sold as no fly or preferral. Here are the insecticides we generally recommend for Western flower tips. Again, read the label, because some of these may be phytotoxic, especially if when poinsettia is here in BRAC. And again, understand the mode of action and develop rotation programs that are involving using products with different modes of action within a generation or once every uh, once a week or once every two weeks during the, during the late fall. The next pest is called broad mite. It's a microscopic mite. This is the one where you're going to need some high level magnification because these are very small uh, mites. And um, uh, this is a close up of an image from Karen Rain at the University of Maryland where you have the adult mite there and the eggs are all, they have bumps on them. And that's how you separate them from cyclamen mite, which has naked eggs. Uh, so when you look under a microscope, you'll either see the adults or nymphs or the eggs uh, within, under the magnification that you have. This is just an image showing uh, some electron microscopy images of these mites and really representing how small they are. This is the damage they cause in poinsettia. They tend to cause distortion. Uh, looks like a phenoxy herbicide. Looks like, actually looks like some, um, maybe a micronutrient toxicity or deficiency. But if you excise that tissue uh, and put it under a microscope, you would definitely either see the nymphs adults or the eggs with the bumps on them. And that would be an indication that broad mites are, are causing this, this damage. Now, what about management? Because the, the damage is evident, it's really going to be too late to do anything. Once you see plants that are showing symptoms or damage, immediately remove them and also the ones probably surrounding them because all, although they're not exhibiting symptoms, they're probably infected with broad mites. And when you're scouting, yeah, you're just going to have to look at plants that are exhibiting damage and quickly remove them as soon as possible. We do have some miticides for broad mite. Uh, Avid, Scirocco, Pylon, Judo, and Contos have translaminar activity, and those are the ones that are most likely to be successful because 
that will get into the regions where the broad mites are feeding. Now, again, read the label because some of those products cannot be used in poinsettias when they're in brack. The next pest is kind of an anomaly. We've seen it a couple times during the year, uh, excuse me, a certain, a certain times of year, but it's the Lewis mite. And the Lewis mite is a relative of the two-spotted spider mite. And this is the, the visual symptoms you'll see in the lower leaves of poinsettias that are infested with Lewis mites. And Lewis mite, again, looks like a two-spotted spider mite. It's a little bit smaller, and it doesn't have the distinct two spots on either sides of the abdomen as two-spotted spider mite does. Here's another image. This is probably a male, but again, you do, you do see a blackening area, but it's not as distinct as you would see for two-spotted spider mite. And again, the management cultural, remove all weeds and avoid over-fertilizing plants, which, you've, which we have already highlighted for previous pests. And then scouting involves visual inspections. And one way to do this efficiently is take some of the leaves, shake them over a white piece of paper, and you'll see the mites on there. They'll, they'll move kind of slowly, and that'll give you an indication if Lewis mites uh, are infecting your plants and the level of the infestation. We do have uh, contact miticides and translaminar miticides and biological control agents such as some of the predatory mites and a predatory midge called Feltiella carasuga, uh, which has been shown to be effective against Lewis mites in other production systems. And again, just like two-spotted spider mite, uh, the same products uh, that are out there, Pylon and Tetrasan do have that translaminar activity as does Judo. But again, I'll say it, that you've got to read the label. And if poinsettias are in BRAC, you don't want to use those products that on the label state do not use on BRACs because you will definitely get some phytotoxicity. The next pest is one that's been kind of up and coming over the years based on my observations, and that is the mealybug. Mealybugs are just like white flies. They're flown feeders. They cause leaf distortion, plant stunting and wilting. But another characteristic is they produce a lot amount or large amount or copious amounts of honeydew, which is a sticky liquid. Uh, and it can be very difficult to handle poinsettias when they're covered with a sticky honeydew. This is a general life cycle of mealybugs. What I want to highlight is the first three stages up here are the ones that are susceptible to contact insecticides. Once the mealybugs molt and have that white coating, most of the contacts won't penetrate because this creates a barrier preventing the solution from reaching their actual cuticle and moving into the, into the insect. Now the males become the winged individual and eventually die, but the females continue reproducing produce eggs, they can produce up to 600 eggs, and then the females die. This is what we've seen. This is mealybugs feeding on the stem. They tend to prefer the, meat, the stem of the poinsettias more so than other parts. Uh, however, that would be contingent on the density of mealybugs on the poinsettia plants. Sometimes you'll see mealybugs along with white flies, as shown by this image. Uh, mealybugs are a really sneaky pest. Uh, the crawlers are so small, they can get in your hands. So if you're handling poinsettias from one greenhouse to the next, you might want to wash your hands in between either a bench or a greenhouse because the crawlers can get in your hands, and if you handle poinsettias in a separate greenhouse, they can be transferred onto plants. Uh, that'll minimize uh, moving mealybugs because once mealybugs get to this stage again with that waxy coating, they are very difficult to to deal with with contact insecticides. Now, these are mealybugs that are feeding on a pot. Now, in actuality, mealybugs have not evolved the, uh, the ability to feed on plastic pots, but growers get excited about this, and what this is are the cocoons of the males. The males will come down into an area under the rim of a pot and pupate, and then again, like I mentioned before, they become winged individuals, mate with the females, and die, but uh, it would be very hard to sell a plant, uh, an entire poinsettia plant, with all these white pupa cases of mealybugs there. So what about mealybug management? Well, remove heavily infested plants. I, I stress, don't try to salvage poinsettias with a heavy population. You'll be spending too much time and money, and you're probably not going to solve the problem. So remove them, uh, give them to a friend or a competitor. That's the best way to handle it. Avoid over-fertilizing the plants. This was stress with white flies. 
scouting is iffy. Uh, you can't see the crawlers very well, and if you start seeing egg-laying females, it's almost too late. But it is a good idea to uh, basically pick out or select randomly some plants and just briefly spend a couple of minutes looking at them and trying to find crawlers or some of the earlier, the later life stages to avoid dealing with outbreaks of mealybugs because your options become very, very limited. So what can you do for mealybugs? Well, we have contact insecticides, systemics, and insect growth regulators. And we do have some biocontrol agents, although some of these uh, are not effective, uh, especially when mealybug populations are high. You should never use biocontrol. These almost have to be used even before seeing your first mealybug. You have to use them as a preventative basis. What can you use for mealybugs? Well, again, I'm just going to say the same thing. Read the label, and you have to make contact activity, which means thorough application of plant parts and multiple applications. Be sure to read the label because some of these products may burn the poinsettia, Sprax, but one of my recommendations is if you're going to use a contact for mealybugs prior to BRAC formation, TriStar in our studies seem to be one of the best materials as a contact for mealybugs. We've also been evaluating some of the systemics, such as Safari Marathon, and we are finding out that systemics are less effective against mealybugs than they are against white flies. So if you're going to use Safari, uh, be aware that you may not get sufficient mortality or control with any of the systemics, such as Safari, Marathon, or Flagship. The last one I want to talk about, which wasn't on the list, but can be a problem, especially in the propagation, and that is shore flies. Shore flies are primarily a nuisance. They don't really feed on Point City plant roots, but high populations can result in the rejection of a shipment of Point City and uh, basically make it unfavorable for people to go around because some of these flies will actually get in their workers' noses and actually become a problem. This is an example of the shore fly life cycle. The key identification for shore flies is shore fly adults have five white spots on the wings. Also, the larval stage does not have a black head capsule, which is, that's what distinguishes them from uh, fungus net uh, larva. And then you have the pupa stage and the egg. Shore flies love moist conditions, and that's why they're more of a problem under propagation than they will be uh, under the later stages of pr production of poinsettias. Here's an example of an adult on a sticky card, and if you can count it, there's one, two, three, four, five white spots on the wings. Now, do they cause damage? Well, if you have a high population of them, they will actually, we'll talk about poop on plants, but I want to say that algae management is critical. Anywhere there's algae growing, it's a nice habitat for shore fly development. And the only damage they may cause from a visual cosmetic standpoint is they will poop uh, on plants, and this black material you see is their uh, fecal deposits. And you can't get it off because it adheres a leaf, but I have seen instances where under high populations, there's so much shore fly poop that the grower cannot sell the plants. Uh, he tried to think of it as a new variety, but uh, he decided not to do that. So here again, I want to fungus net adults on the left, Y-shaped in the wings, kind of resemble a mosquito, long legs, shore fly adults, robust, short antenna, and has five white spots on the wings. So after this webinar, you should be able to easily distinguish fungus net adults from shore fly adults. Well, how do you manage shore fly? Avoid overwatering and avoid algae growth. Shore flies love algae, so anytime you can eliminate it, you're going to reduce or alleviate your problems with shore flies. You can position yellow sticky cards above the crop canopy because shore flies are much better flyers uh, as adults than fungus nets. So you place them about an inch or two above the crop canopy, and that's where you'll catch most of your shore fly adults. Now, there are some insecticides registered for shore fly. These are all for the larval stages. The azadiractin, the cyromazine, and the, the pyroproxifen are all insect growth regulators, whereas Duragard 
is a contact. Now, when you're dealing with adults, you can spray with something, but you have to use high volume applications or autofoggers because the adults can actually escape spray applications uh, by going ahead of the spray. There's sort of a barrier, an air barrier ahead of the spray, and they actually get pushed away from the spray and actually can escape exposure. So that is the end of my portion of this webinar uh, at this point. Uh, we've gone through, uh, sort of summarized uh, many of the, the primary major pests that you will encounter, uh, growing point cities and production systems, and the ways to manage them, both from a cultural, scouting, pesticidal, and biological standpoint. So I thank you for your attention. I hope you all learned something. And with that, I'd be happy to address any questions or comments. Okay, Rick, we've got a, a few questions. Uh, the first one uh, is about uh, the white fly. I um, heard that uh, some of the, um, the Q-type bio, um, biotype white flies are, are more resistant to some of the different insecticides. How can an individual tell if they have the Q-type um, biotype white fly? That's a good question. And from a standpoint, a, a grower cannot tell the difference morphologically. What they have to do is collect some samples and send them to a laboratory. The one that I'm t is one in Arizona, they will do some DNA testing and they can tell at that point if you're dealing with the Q or the B biotype. And what the person should do is do a Google search for uh, Q biotype analysis and they should come up with a website uh, or an address where they can send the samples to. All right, um, and another quick question here. Do shorefly larvae cause any damage? Uh, no, uh, they do not. Uh, they primarily feed on algae or on other organic matter. We have yet to find them actually uh, feeding on plant roots. Uh, if you're growing mushrooms, though, they, other than poinsettias, they can be a problem. But in regards to poinsettias, uh, they're feeding on the algae or the old growing medium or any organic matter in there. All right, one last question. I think this pertains to some of the, the beneficials. Um, this individual says that they have something called robber flies on their, their plants at, at shipping. And even though they're a beneficial, they can be a concern as a pest to, to buyers. And, and wonder if, there's, if you have um, any thoughts on, on dealing with that. Well, that's a good question. I think the individual means hunter flies. And hunter flies are uh, flies that actually have been shown to be very effective in killing both shore fly and fungus net adults. They reside on the leaves and when the shore flies or fungus net adults are flying around, they fly off, grab them, bring them back and kill them. Um, yeah, the problem is that they, they do resemble uh, shore fly adults. So there may be a problem with having those flies there because the end uh, user or the, peop the individual or company that received the poinsettias may think they're shore flies when in fact they are actually hunter flies. All right, Ray, um, that's all the questions we have. Um, Brian Whipker and Kelly, I'm going to unmute you for just a moment here. Um, do either either of you guys have any uh, any last comments that you'd like to make? Um, uh, my only comment is that if um, a grower has a problem, whether it's a disease or even an insect or uh, nutritional, and they haven't solved it. They really, and getting an accurate di diagnosis is the first step to solving your problem. So I highly recommend um, using the plant clinics in your in your state to uh, to help you manage your plant diseases. All right, thank you, Kelly. Well, I, I thank all of you for attending today. I hope uh, you all take away something from, from this webinar. And as I mentioned before, we have recorded this. So if you want to go back and, and review it, it will be up on our eGrow website um, in, in the next few days or next week or so. Uh, we'll send out a, a notification through our normal eGrow uh, mailing list that, that it's posted. If any of you happen to um, not be on our, our mailing list, you can go to just e-gro uh, and dot org and get on our mailing list. Um, so, um, so please do that if you're not already on the uh, on the mailing list. 
Uh, if you want a handout of this, this presentation uh, of just a PDF to, to view, you can go to um, my website, which is www.nhfloriculture.com. That's New Hampshire Floriculture, nhfloriculture.com. Uh, and you should see a link to the, uh, the slide set in a PDF form. Uh, so with that, thank you and, and have a great afternoon. Thank you for attending. Brian, are you still there? I uh, am. Krug? Yes. Please be sure to watch part one on common poinsettia diseases with Kelly Ivers and part two on plant nutrition with Brian Whipker.